Welcome to the Floyd Memorial Library podcast, where you'll find information on what's going on on the North Fork of Long Island. We'll be focusing on issues and opportunities going on in the community, as well as people and stories from the present and the past. I'm your host, Christopher Bianchi, and for episode 14, we have Glennis Barry. She's been living on the North Fork for quite a while now and we talked to her about her time growing up in Massachusetts and what influenced her as a young adult. And we talk about her time in college and what she did after school through her career and also her time at, in the Yale Architecture School as well as working for the Department of Transportation in New York City and some of the projects she worked on for making New York City a more walkable city, and also how she decided to move out onto the North Fork and what attracted her to the area, opening up an art gallery in Greenport, as well as getting involved with the environment and water quality in the area. So I hope you enjoy episode 14 with Glennis Barry. Welcome to the podcast today. Thank you for coming on. Thank you. So just in the beginning, if you could give us a little background about yourself. I was born in Providence, Rhode Island, but grew up in a small factory town that started as a communistic utopian society in in Massachusetts (laughs) called Hopedale. And I think I'm really from the industrial revolution my (laughs) grandmother worked from the time she was 12 in factories and my dad worked as an engineer um in the factory all his life so i'm very aware of both the good and the bad um of the digital age versus the industrial age So you said Hopedale? Massachusetts. Where is that in Massachusetts? If you drew a triangle between Boston, Worcester, and Providence, it's right in the middle. It's just above Rhode Island. Was it a, like, it seemed like Massachusetts and the outer areas of Boston were definitely involved in the Industrial Revolution Mm -hmm. in the U.S. What manufacturing were there? They actually designed and built looms that the other textile industries would use and at one time they were the largest loom manufacturer in the world wow and then germany and japan took over and then in the 70s they moved it down south mm-hmm. and basically it disappeared okay. <laughs> so and you said it, that area was kind of a utopia yeah it it, it was I was actually very proud of it when I grew <laughs> up. Um, it was a minister, and uh, Aidan Ballou, and he had um, an ongoing argument with other Protestant sects about life after death. So he went through the Bible and looked yeah. at all the citations. And when he was through, he said, you know what? The other guys are right. <laughs> so his congregation kicked him out. Oh. And then he started writing to Duff's Dostoevsky and Fourier and -hmm. then started this little commune and Mm. then there was a tiny factory that was making looms and it started taking off so they said do you mind if we dissolve this you know (laughs) but we'll be responsible and they were they had some of the best housing um, for an industrial area and they tried to take care of the residents quite well. And what about your, you said your parents worked in the area. Did they grow up in that part of Massachusetts? No. My mom was from East Providence. Um, (laughs) Both my parents very much product of the Depression. Um, She came from a large family and they lost their home during the Depression and would sell Christmas trees to make enough money to, you know, for presents. Mm. But there was never a sense of being poor, mm. you know, um, because everybody was in the same boat. Yes. So, and she was a tomboy. Um, <laughs> she played on a boy's baseball team. And during the war, she was on one of those women's softball teams. 
Oh, wow. So um, she didn't graduate from high school, but she worked hard all her life and she enjoyed people. And my dad was from England. And when he grew up, he never lived in the same place more than a year. So again, during the depression, going from one place to another. And he worked in an airplane factory when he was 14. And um, then eventually he was accepted to um, be a pilot, which he wanted to do, but the factory wouldn't let him go. And then eventually he wrote to Churchill asking to be drafted <laughs> oh, because wow. he was seeing London being bombed. Yes. I mean, you know, they were living through that. And eventually he was in the British Army as a royal engineer. But I only discovered like a year or so ago, he was probably a prisoner of war for most of the time in Southeast Asia. So, And he wow. never talked about it. Never. And then after the war, he was on his way to Canada, but was stopping in Rhode Island to stay with relatives and then met my mom in a jewelry factory. <laughs> <laughs> and they went on from there. Wow. <laughs> how, how did you find out that information about prisoner of war? I have an English cousin that I just renewed contact with, and he said... Did your father have malaria and was he a prisoner of war? I said, well, I know he had malaria, but I didn't know about the prisoner of war. Mm. So I've actually written to the British government to kind of see if I can get confirmation. And I haven't received it yet. But I did find this little book mm. where he's supposed to be stationed and all the pages are ripped out except the last one. Oh, wow. So I think it could be true. Wow. <laughs> And did he ever tell you anything about what he thought of the U.S. or America when he came over and why he decided? Well, I guess he met your your mother. Right. But did he ever feel like he wanted to go back to England? He never expressed that. I was with him one time when he went back to England. Oh, probably about 1980. And he went back to where one of the factories was that he worked in and the whole place had been bombed and he couldn't recognize anything and he cried mm -hmm. um and in london he said it's not just a different time it's a different place mm -hmm. so as time evolves you know it, it the whole interaction is different um both of the people and the attitude and the place itself yes so but I never got that sense from him. You know, he mm -hmm. went back a couple of times, but um, no, I think, it, you know, his youth was so uncertain that I think his goal was to create um, sort of a, a base for the family. So he was very much a family man. Um, worked supported it, you know he's very protective of the small family unit yes so he didn't have very many friends he was very almost secretive in mm -hmm. a way but if he had been a prisoner of war that might have explained that might have explained so. <laughs> something <laughs> and you said he met your, your mother in the, a jewelry factory yes in providence i think it was providence either providence uh, or Pawtucket, somewhere in Rhode Island. Uh, and you grew up? I grew up in Hopedale, Massachusetts. When my dad got a job, they moved there and grew up there. So, a small town, 2,500. <laughs> wow. And how was it for you growing up there as a child? It was both great and I couldn't wait to leave. Um, it, there was a pond with woods around it. That was the mill pond, which I just adored. It was, everything was there. The park was across the street for playing. It, it, it was a great place to grow up. I always had my nose in a book. So I was always interested in the world further abroad. And part of me couldn't wait to escape. <laughs> <laughs> 
because it felt like a smaller town that you wanted to explore. Mm -hmm. And would you go into Boston? Not very often, no. Not very yeah. often. Our music teacher took us a couple of times to go to concerts. She was great. <laughs> yeah. And how is it going to school there? I was really lucky. Um, it was a small school, but some of the teachers were so dedicated. So, you know, it was a basic public education, but the teachers cared. Um, we had an English teacher who was just inspiring. And the math teachers would, like, they taught an extra class for people. It wasn't offered, but they just did it because they wanted to. So it, so it was actually a very good school. And do you have any, while, while you were a child, do you have any childhood role models that you could think of? Would you say your parents were definitely? Yes, I think they were definitely role models. Um, very much so. And my, my mom worked in the cafeteria of the school, um, first as a dishwasher and then as a baker. And she was never afraid to be a little goofy. You know, she would dress up in costumes on the holidays <laughs> for the little kids and, <laughs> and do stuff like that. Um, and, and they both went out and got second jobs to help, you know, pay hmm. to go to school. But my nose was in a book, and hmm. I adored King Arthur. <laughs> so, <laughs> so King Arthur was probably one of my favorite uh, sort of personalities in a way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. And going through elementary school, middle school, and getting into high school, were you thinking about what you wanted to do in life? I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I ended up doing what I wasn't good at and not doing what I was good at. <laughs> <laughs> Just because I wanted to keep learning and be exposed to things. <laughs> so you said like, you were good at reading. No, I was good at math and science. <laughs> <laughs> I just love to read. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> And then would your parents ask you, or were they kind of open-minded in what they said, oh, well, you could go do this, or... They, they just gave me as many possibilities as I wanted, but they didn't mm -hmm. pressure me. But, you know, the ballet classes and the piano <laughs> classes and things like that. <laughs> and so did you have to work in high school? At... I, um... I was really lucky. I was a good swimmer, and they opened the state pool the year that I became eligible to start working. Oh, wow. So I was a lifeguard wow. at the state <laughs> pool at the top of the hill. <laughs> so it was a great job. But before that, while I was waiting for that, you know, I was a cashier at a small department store. I tried cocktail waitressing, but it lasted no more than two weeks, especially when I dropped a tray of drinks in the owner's wife's lap. <laughs> that didn't go over very well. <laughs> and I had no idea what the names of the drinks were. So that was not a successful career for me. <laughs> oh. So, and then what did you do after high school? I went to college. Um, I went to Smith College for four years. And that's... As part in Western, Western Mass. Mass and I went to Bowdoin College for one semester on exchange while it was still a men's college and is Bowdoin's college is in Maine? Maine and how was it going to Smith College it was mixed I love the education and the teachers mm -hmm. were really good there there was also I was a scholarship kid and there was a little bit of not prejudice, but a different attitude um, a little bit when you were at school. It's di Ooh. very different now. Um, but it, so I didn't quite realize it until almost the end, no. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, but so it was a mixed experience. 
And the scholarship, that was something you could apply for coming out of high school? Yeah, it was a combination. I mean, I got a lot of grants um, when I graduated, and then I got a grant for half of my tuition from Smith. And when you were at Smith's College, was it pretty open in terms of what classes you could take, or did you still have to go down a certain? It it was it was right at the, it was nineteen seventy, so it was the first year they lifted a lot of restrictions, mm -hmm. but there were still basic courses you had to take mm -hmm. in certain topics. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I didn't like is I was taking studio art but I wanted to take the curatorial art museum course, but they weren't, they wouldn't allow that, you know? Oh. So, so there were certain things they would allow and certain mm -hmm. things they wouldn't, so. But, um, but the teachers were great. It was a good education. And were you focused more in the arts at Smith's College? Yeah, um, I, was taking English and art um, instead of math and science. <laughs> <laughs> I could have had a full scholarship if I had been an engineer at a different college, but I chose. <laughs> it's like I'm still there's something attracting me to the arts, and, <laughs> right? Even though even though I couldn't do either one very well. <laughs> And so you, what did you, gra you graduated with a, a double major, double major in, in English and, English studio. and <laughs> studio arts. <laughs> wow. And what did you do after you graduated? I went to Alaska for a year <laughs> and um, I was on my way to San Francisco to thinking I wanted to go to grad school hmm. there. And instead I got a job at the Alaska State Museum. And it was the best job I've ever had, but it was my first job. And so I didn't realize how great it was because I thought all jobs would be like that. <laughs> my boss was tremendous. He, um, I was the first woman he had hired. Mm -hmm. um, so, and he had just gotten married late in life. And he, he said, well, if I'm gonna do this women's lib thing, you're gonna do everything the guys do. <laughs> and so there would be these tall six foot guys and little chubby short me in the back, like oh, wow. hauling things. And we shared um, a desk in the wood shop and he taught me how to use all the equipment. And he was just fabulous. Wow, and, so, and what was your job there? Exhibition design. Exhibition design. And were you, was that something, were you looking all over the country or? No, I just stumbled. You're just, you're just like. It, it, that was the time in Alaska where it was very fluid. Mm -hmm. um, it was just bef when the oil was starting to change. Mm -hmm. So people held on to jobs, but nobody held on to a job. So it didn't matter if it was a great job or a bad job. They kind of took it for a few months to a year and then they moved on and did something else. So. If you were around at the right moment, you get fabulous jobs. <laughs> yes. I did work as a maid in a hotel for two weeks before I got the job in the museum. So you just had to be ready to do whatever you needed to do. In in the meantime, before, until something right. came up. Yeah. And you were in Alaska for a year. Mm -hmm. And was that, how was it? Was that in Anchorage? It was in Juneau. It was magical. Is that... It's on the panhandle. How was it living there? Just... It, it was like a dream. It, everything was so vivid. The personalities were... If I don't know if you've ever seen Northern Exposure. Um, no. It was a TV program. But they kind of captured... Like, everybody had a story. And nobody was making a judgment about people. So there was... I, I mean, you could write a book about all the people up there. And the landscape is just so overpowering with these mountains just dropping into the sea. And there were wooden sidewalks and stairs, so it was like being in the Old West. Because oh, wow. just the sound of when you were walking. Walking and the yeah. creak, creaking. Yeah, and... yeah. It, so everything was so atmospheric. And then in winter, there was no light. And in summer, you could walk in the mountains 
all night if you mm-hmm. wanted to, you, you know. So it's just extremes uh, that were very vivid and very beautiful. And so what happened after you left that position? I went back to art school at VU for one year until I got down to my last $50. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I Oh, no, I did something before that. I taught on the Canadian border and cried every day. I was not a good teacher. <laughs> and so I kind of said, I don't think this is working. And then I went back to grad school for a year. Where, where, where on the Canadian border? Callis. Oh, and that, that's in Maine. Yeah. Um, I loved Maine. So, yeah. I, but all the pollution from the paper factories like rolled under the door of the room I was renting. And oh. I, I just, I, it was, anyway. I, there are a lot of things I wasn't good at <laughs> during this period. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then you said you went you went to BU for for a year until I ran out of money, and then I went to New York City, and I worked at a publishing house, pasting up the ads for books. You oh. know, they used to have these pamphlets that they yes. mailed to you with the books. So my job was to paste them in before oh. they were printed. Wow! So. And um, for a publishing company, for a publishing crown publishing. Oh, and you know, I had no money, so they had this place called Webster Hall, which was where women could stay, and you gave a proportion of your income, and you got a meal and a little room, and everything was painted blue <laughs> <laughs> in the room. <laughs> so, the first thing I did was buy yellow chrysanthemum to put in, but. It, you know, it was great when you have no money and you're in the middle of the city. And then I got a job, believe it or not, from that as a director of a children's museum in Connecticut. Oh, Don't wow. ask me how. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and I was there for three and a half years. So that was a mm-hmm. great experience. But it was in the suburbs and I was single and it's like, eh. <laughs> it's, it's kind of isolated. Exactly. And... Everybody I knew was married. And yeah. it was like. And you're like, oh, I'm surrounded by children. <laughs> right. And... So then I got an internship at the Museum of Natural History for a year in mm-hmm. exhibit design. And at the end of the year, I worked on the Hall of Asian Peoples. And the curator was going to Egypt and said I could come along if I wanted. So I was, it was only a small group, about six people or so, and I went to Egypt on a dig. Wow, and this was in the (laughs) 70s? That was 1980. Wow. And that was incredible because Mm -hmm. I'd never been, I love exotic atmospheres. Yes. So, and I'd never really been in the desert before, so it's just amazing. And I got to stay in Chicago House, which was like a colonial era, like oasis in the middle of chaos. And then we were in a kind of remote, we were staying in a bombed out hotel where we were fed <laughs> kios of meat every day. And then we would travel by Jeep to the site of in the fields wow but, so it was incredible and then one of the people there told me about a dig in israel but there was two months gap so we went to paris and then again having no money after they kick you out of the hostels after a couple weeks so there's a bookstore called shakespeare's yes right across from notre dame and in return for working an hour a day, you got to sleep on one of their couches. Oh, really? But you got locked in at night. <laughs> <laughs> at yes. midnight, you got locked in. Wow. And um, so that was incredible. I got to stay there. And I got bed bugs from their couch. Oh. So, so after cleaning everything, they let me stay in the rear book room all by myself. Which yeah. and so 
I'm just lying there on this thing, looking at Notre Dame. It was like heaven. Surrounded by <laughs> books. Surrounded by books. Wow. It, it was just incredible. And that was that your first time in Europe? It was the second time. When I second. was in college, I went in January with a friend and we did a little tour. Nice. But this part was all... The second trip, you included that with Egypt because you were waiting right. to go to Israel. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I never knew that about the Shakespeare Company. It was that amazing. Was... Um, and the little bit, um, the current owner had just been born, so she was a baby when we oh, were there. Okay. So they probably wow. needed help more. Help. But it was fun because upstairs, uh, that's where the couches were. But during the day, they encourage people to just hang out there to mm -hmm. practice their English. So there was a guy from Africa that I became friends with. And my last night, I couldn't stay because I had to get the early morning bus, like at two in the morning, go to Greece to, you know. So he stayed up all night with me. But it was just really interesting um just hearing his background hmm. and how he was coming to study art um agriculture but he was learning english and wow. so just finding out about the culture so it it was fun that way because you met a lot of people from different areas and you said you were going to greece after that to catch the ferry to go to israel and what was your favorite place out of, well, but I guess it would only be between Egypt and France, Israel. Oh, I mean, I loved Luxor, I loved Paris, and I loved Jerusalem. And it breaks my heart because when I was in Israel, you got a sense that, um, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim could live peacefully together. And I went to um, Sinai, and one of the tour guides, um, an Israeli man, was talking about how the, you know they'd given Sinai back to Egypt as a way to continue peace, and how they had to keep giving back. Mm -hmm. So. To me at that time, it was really an example of generosity and coexistence. And so what's happening now just breaks my heart because mm -hmm. it's so not what I experienced when I was there. And this was 1980? Yeah, 19... Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It totally different attitude. Mm. And I walked... Um, the West Bank um, mm. from Jerusalem it, through the trail and it, it was just wonderful seeing the mm. villages there and the fact that they're being pushed out mm. it was I don't know it's like why people can't just coexist I mm -hmm. don't understand it but I was lucky to have seen that but it didn't last <laughs> so at this time you were doing these two archaeology mm. digs was that, was that something you wanted to continue i was trying to decide <laughs> so i went back home i applied it was either going to be anthropology or architecture and it was architecture not because i liked architecture mm -hmm. but it's because i didn't like what i was seeing and i thought maybe i could i really liked indigenous architecture so I was thinking, well, maybe I can try and make better space with the same materials or something like that. And, or anthropology, because I was very interested in cultures. So I applied to schools and I got accepted at Cambridge in anthropology and Yale in architecture. Wow. And decided to go to Yale. Um, and that was, it's one of the top architecture schools <laughs> oh that's another funny story <laughs> i got far by being not great <laughs> um it was the first year they accepted six people with no architectural background in the graduate program 
Oh. And they did that because they thought it would broaden the experience of the rest <laughs> of the students. But when I went, they didn't do anything for us. They just like dumped us in the class. They're like, all right, you're, yeah. you're coming from a different background, but right. we're not going to tell right. you. Yeah, now they still do that, but now mm-hmm. they have a summer training where they train them. Oh. I didn't know how to draft. I didn't know how to make models. My mm-hmm. first model popped apart in front of the jurors, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And at the end of my first year, the teacher turned around and said, I didn't think you could do it. (laughs) (laughs) I actually got the award for best student, but it wasn't because I was the best student. It was because they just had such low expectations for me when I started. (laughs) But No, but that's that's really interesting (laughs) that you were part of the first when they decided to let students in that didn't have have that that background. background. And was this, because I'm trying to remember, they built that building, um, was it by Paul? Rudolph. Rudolph. Yeah. Was that pretty? That was, no, it was before. In fact, they'd already messed up the floors. The floors and yeah, the yeah. library <laughs> yeah. and stuff. <laughs> so. But I, I, I hear that uh, New Haven's interesting in terms of, you can kind of see how they went through different architectural mm-hmm periods from the they have the colonial and obviously it goes up to the 60s with the the brutalists and the modernism and it was still a great building though Mm -hmm. um because it was also about space so people see you know the kind of cracked concrete and it feels yes but actually some of the spaces are quite intimate and decent you Mm. know and he had indoor outdoor he had some terraces and so it's so there's a lot of sensitivity in the building as well yeah because i think it could get a bad rap Mm -hmm. just when you look at it from the outside but it's and even the well actually that's not that's a more early modernist architecture was the ice hockey rink right saranen yes yeah that's quite beautiful yeah it's a beautiful building and Louis Kahn's museums. Yes, the are, British right. Art Museum. And there's a giant parking garage in yes. the downtown. It's like <laughs> amazing. It has the arches and everything. But overall, because you said you're interested more in indigenous architecture, did you feel when you went to the Yale Architecture School that you kind of created your own interest or ideas not not really because i was so busy trying to catch up Mm -hmm. (laughs) so uh, and and again like the staff i mean they gave me the best i had three part-time jobs to support myself because i had no income but they gave me wonderful jobs Mm -hmm. so that it didn't conflict Mm -hmm. so i was the projectionist for the same like series that I would go to so and I was monitoring the wood shop and I was correcting structures homework so I would correct the structures homework while I was in the wood shop (laughs) you know so they gave me like wonderful jobs that didn't take away from the time that I had to be doing things so they were very kind to me (laughs) And in general, how long were you in New Haven? Three years. And this was in the early 80s? Well, mid... Mid 80s. Mid mid 80s. Yeah, yeah. How was it living there? Because I know New Haven gets a a bad reputation. (laughs) Well, first I lived in a basement, and then I lived in an attic room. And I didn't experience the city because I had no money. So I was just, oh. I was just basically studying. And when you're in architecture school, they expect you to be there all night mm. at making things and doing stuff. So I was, I didn't, didn't have much time. I didn't have to... much time for anything else. <laughs> <laughs> and then what did you, did you have to have a final work for graduation or thesis? to finish no we had different studios so you'd have a project in your studio so so you graduated from 
Yeah, what? <laughs> What's next? <laughs> this is another story. I really got far by being not good. My next experience was when I was at Yale, my fourth job was actually hanging the exhibitions in the gallery in the, the A&A building. And I hung an exhibition of a Japanese architect and fell in love with the work. And my last year, he was brought as a guest professor, but yeah. it was by lottery and I was first on the waiting list. So oh, I did how? not get in. And I was just enamored because uh. he also took indigenous and then twisted it so it was contemporary. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, it just spoke to me in many mm -hmm. different ways. So he told the school that there was a fellowship to Japan and he would make sure that somebody from Yale would get it. So at first there were a bunch of people that wanted to do it, but his assistant kept saying, oh, I did it. And you know, it's really hard, you, you know, you're on your own and blah, blah, blah. And gradually everybody dropped out <laughs> except me. <laughs> Got the fellowship by default because I was stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, of course, it's not going to be easy. You're going to another culture. What do you expect? Yeah. So um, I got this amazing fellowship to go to Japan. And when I arrived, he was, was um, they forced them to retire when they're 60s. So he was going to have to retire in six months. So he told me to skip the language training, which I regret, <laughs> and come directly and I was given a choice to act like a student or as a staff member. And I chose to act as a staff member. And little did I know, like the very first day, it was like, oh, it's the end of the day, time to go home. I get, stand up and the woman be saying, no, 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 you can't go until everybody goes, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so you're, you're so six days a week, basically, you were there. And it turns out my future husband um, supervised the office part. So that's how I met my husband. So I saw uh. him every day. <laughs> <laughs> and we were on the same train to go home. Where was this located? Um, it's Okayama Station. Or oh, Kayama Station. I I don't know if it's it's actually in Tokyo. Or it's just just out, outside. Just outside, okay. and the dorm was more in Yokohama. Okay. So you had to travel like an hour to get to the dorm. Wow. You know. So. How was your experience in Japan? Again, it was both wonderful and not. Uh, Tokyo is the only city where I feel I couldn't master it. You know, I'm usually pretty good at orientation and getting a sense of place. Mm -hmm. um, but that disorientation was interesting, too. Mm -hmm. And it's reflected in a lot of the novels of contemporary Japanese writers. So there were a couple of things. <laughs> there were about six other uh, people from other countries that were under the same under the grant. Same grant yeah. And there was a French woman who was fearless. So she would drag me and we would go all over and look at buildings. And, you know, we got in trouble a couple of times, but she was just great. And um, so we saw a lot of architecture. There were connections between the firms. So we would find out when a new building was, we could go see. And it, it was just intense. And I loved the contemporary architecture at that time. Um, so, and it, it can be overwhelming sometimes. There was one time yeah. I missed my connection because it wasn't all in English back yes. then, the station. So yeah. <laughs> there was one time I missed my thing. And I was like, oh, God, how am I ever going to get home? <laughs> <laughs> Were people friendly with helping very, you? Very. Like, um, there was one time I went to a village and I didn't know where the building I wanted to see was. Mm -hmm. And I asked somebody, and I thought they would just point me. She actually took me to the building, and then 
ran back to her job. So people were extremely polite. Yeah. That's one thing about Japan. There's a sense of comfort. <laughs> like people aren't going to be mean to you, <laughs> you know. Yes. Yeah. There's there's a um a formality sometimes to it, but it also leaves room for everybody to coexist. Mm -hmm. Like even in the Kenkyushitsu, which is the studio, um, he would put something out and every person was given a chance to speak. Whereas here, everybody interrupts each other. And mm -hmm. if you're quiet, you don't necessarily There is more to say. politeness and right. just wait your turn to mm -hmm. talk. And some people see that as a restriction, too, mm -hmm. but it, it also gives room for people. And so you said you met your future husband. Mm -hmm. Were you ever thinking about staying in Japan? No. no. You were like, oh, I'm going to come back to... Yeah. Yeah. Would you come back to New York or Connecticut or... We didn't know. Um, when we got married... Well, I, I said, you know, I have to go back to the States because I don't have my license. I said, I need to get my license <laughs> after doing all this architectural <clears throat> stuff. So at least I want to go back to the States until mm -hmm. I get a license. And so we looked at both Boston and New York for jobs. And New York, my husband got a job like that. It took me oh. longer. <laughs> wow. and, and New York was more open. They were more interested in like what are the possibilities boston was a little more closed and was he okay with moving to the u.s it was a big move for him yeah um i know it was difficult because we both are bad at language mm -hmm. so he has the same problems i have and i just remember in restaurants everybody would ask you what kind of dressing you want what kind oh. of potatoes what kind of this and this <laughs> and then I would just repeat it, but he understood when I said it, and they're looking at me like you just said what I said. Why is he <laughs> listening to you? Yeah. You know? So, but um, he got a great job working at Stephen Hall Architects, who had a, who had just gotten a job in Japan. So it just worked out really oh, well. Okay. And then you said you eventually. I got ended it. up working for the city. I worked. For three months in an architectural firm and then i worked for the city and urban design oh wow and this was in the department of transportation what year 89 so you had to work on different planning yeah it was <laughs> it was really i really enjoyed it actually <laughs> um our job was to look at the street projects and see if we could enhance it um, you know, like look for triangles and that mm -hmm. we could plant and that. And the city was having a fiscal crisis. So the big thing was, no, you can't do that. It has to be plain vanilla, you know. Oh. So then they were saying, well, you can't do anything. You know, we're not giving you money for anything. So what happened is I started thinking, well, why are we even doing this? And it was basically for the pedestrian. So everybody was focused on cars and bikes, but what about the pedestrians? So I ended up writing a grant and starting the whole pedestrian projects. Oh, wow. With the city. And so it's just so much fun because you have all these resources and, and yet you don't have the resources. So <laughs> you have to create the resources. And then mm -hmm. once you have the resources, then you can kind of do what you want to do. So, do you think before this time, do you think New York city was they weren't really focused on the pedestrians as much not as much there there was some good work in the 70s and there was a nonprofit that was focused on pedestrian mm -hmm. issues but the city's attitude toward the pedestrian was just to look at the 10 top accident locations mm -hmm. so we totally changed how they looked at it. Um, we really analyzed the accidents. It took two years because it was GIS, but it was before 
you had the, your data set, so it, yes. it had to manually all the data had to put all that change in. the format from wow. the, from the state, and you know, so it took a long time. But then once we did it, we could map it with land use mm -hmm. and with the streets and see patterns of types of accidents, not just. Mm -hmm. And we didn't look at just fatalities because you know fatalities a factor of the person, mm. it, not just of the action. So, and and then of course enhancement as mm. well, but more like climate and tree, and trees. And it, it, so we looked at, you know, I stalked pedestrians. I would follow them <laughs> to see how they how were are they being. walking. Yeah. And I used to count them and we did everything ourselves, um, which was part of the fun. We wrote Ports, we went out and did the research and I had two s stories. One time I was counting and the guy said, don't stand there. You're a homeless guy. Don't mm -hmm. stand there. The pigeons will drop on your head <laughs> there. So they were giving me advice on where to stand. And then another time I was in Red Hook and I had been counting, but I thought I would ask people about mm -hmm the pedestrian asked and there was a guy sitting on the bench so I sat down beside him and I started asking him those questions and he's like er, 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 please go away and then finally he got up and left uh -huh. and, and another guy came up and he said you know he's the biggest loan shark he's waiting for everybody to get their check <laughs> wow. so there were all these wonderful like colorful experiences to mm -hmm. just going all over the city Wow. And where were you living at that time while you were working for the transportation department? We had a studio apartment on 4th Avenue between oh. 11th and 12th. Wow. Was it interesting at that time? I mean, living in New York and... I, it was amazing for me. I w would walk to work and just, I loved seeing everything on the street. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I could Within walking distance, there was the park, grocery store, hardware store, lumber yard, Strand, mm -hmm. with all the books, was one block away. Wow. <laughs> you know, it, art supply stores, you yeah. know. So it was like, um, it was amazing. Yeah. Did you work for other places in New York City after the transportation department? There... Uh, I did work for an architectural firm. I stayed for 11 years. I don't know how frank I should be, but when Giuliani was, he was so destructive. When, when did he come in? in? In the 90s. Yeah. And um, I think people always say that you started to see New York started to change. And obviously people might have different opinions. Yeah, he really tried to destroy the department, and it was very upsetting for me. And it's a, it's probably too much to tell, <laughs> but I actually took a year's leave of absence because I was so upset mm -hmm. of what was happening to my program because I, I cared so much about it, and I didn't. They were trying to tear it apart. And this was the pedestrian program yeah and then when i came back they actually eventually put me in charge of the whole capital program so uh, but after a year of you know <laughs> being sidelined so uh, so but it, it was like a mixture because the yeah. person who was destroying it then realized that i was honest with him and then he was sorry so it was like you know, but <laughs> I mean, it's still interesting hearing when you were there when you started. You noticed that some changes that were happening and cuts and prioritizing it, other things it, that there were amazing people in the department that had such institutional memory. Mm -hmm. There was one guy who could tell me the design of every street corner in the mm -hmm. city. And he could talk on the phone what he would allow me to do. He said, oh, you're messing up my streets again. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay, maybe I can let you do this. And, you know, yeah. and there was a guy who actually had a house out here that was in charge of the real estate. And he was a real public servant. Hmm. He always made decisions on what he thought was best for the public. So I was always amazed at how much 
so few people did. Mm. And they really cared. Mm. So I have a great respect for civil servants, real mm -hmm. civil servants that aren't just in it for the paycheck. I, but most of the people I knew really cared about what they were doing. And about the, the city and about the city and pedestrians and safety and yeah and not not prioritizing the automobile oh no they did I, they, <laughs> that was their job and, and they took it seriously and I I had arguments for years with the head of the engineering <laughs> 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 you know but it was okay because you just argued about the subject yes you know and then when they would say no you would figure out okay well how can I get them to accept it and they would actually help me find mm -hmm. the solution so you know it was it was intense but it was um i have a great real great deal of respect for the people working there and you said so you were there 11, 11 years. years and then um about was i i don't even remember two or three years at an architectural firm and then um hideaki wanted to start his own so Actually, while I was still at DOT, we found the land and uh, built our own house. And from that, we started getting work out here. Wow. So our first client was a curator at the Met. Oh, <laughs> so, wow. it, so I always said we had the best clients and the tiniest projects. <laughs> it was like this little knuckle kitchen yes. in his house. And he would like harangue his friends to hire us. And some of them became really good friends. So we ended up having a life out here and said, why are we like working all this time to keep two places? Let's just move out here. Was there something that attracted you out here or just? Yes, absolutely. We first, when we first thought of trying to build something on our own, um, I had no interest in Long Island. Um, I thought it was just flat and boring. Flat and <laughs> suburban. Suburban and, and right. developments. Everything looks the same. Right. And so I saw an auction for some land in, um, was it Mauritius or somewhere down there? And we went to it, but they pulled all the land because there were too few people. <laughs> and they knew it would get it for like peanuts. So, but it got us coming out here. And as soon as I saw Greenport and Orient, it was so close to my experience in New England that we just fell in love with it and said, okay, this is a place we could be. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it does have that, I think on the, at least the North Fork or, and out this way, you can feel a little bit of the, or a lot of the New England right. influence and yeah that's definitely I, I see that and so you said you started your architecture practice out here mm -hmm. and that kind of flourished well in the city we had no clients <laughs> <laughs> and here we had at least a couple <laughs> so i don't know how you call it flourish but we had it was wonderful did you also Separate from that, did you start an art center? Yeah. Well, actually, <laughs> when we were part-time out here, and I was still working for the city, I think, um, when I was frustrated with the situation, yes, and I just wanted, you know, a different focus, and I had a dream. And I got up in the morning and I said to my husband, I want to go look at stores. And he thought I wanted to go shopping. <laughs> what I wanted to do was find a little place that I could rent to start mm -hmm. an art gallery. And oh, wow. And I found it the first day and it was behind D'Angelo Leather. Hmm. And uh, we just figured out what's the worst that can happen and can we live with it? And it was quite fun and at the same time there were two other galleries that started at the same time um yellow house and whitney and so the three of us like it, we coordinated our openings and it was really um 
it was really, I think, served the to help create not an art community, but more awareness of people. But mm -hmm. a lot of artists didn't even know other artists, so it. I think it helped. And when did you open the gallery? 2000. And then do you think before that there were artists out here? Yes, but definitely they, were artists. There were here. artists, but you think they kind of just kept more so to themselves and they had their own studio. Right. But you think this kind of helped start, I guess, not, not like you said, not an art community, but like to bring people together and have some galleries and bring people out here and see if there's like an art scene. Well, I wouldn't, I don't know if I call it an art scene, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was fun, you know, yes. and we coordinated and there was goodwill, I think, between the artists and the gallery and uh, the community. And, you know, before this, and actually, I don't know if it was even during it, there are a group of artists here in Greenport that did a wonderful thing called Footfalls, which oh. I thought was extremely great. And I wish it had continued. But again, it's a lot of work for people. They, they put sculptures throughout mm -hmm. Greenport. And they had a map so you could find it. Oh. And, and it was really great. So Arden Scott was part of that. Yes. And um, I think Poppy Johnson, too. So It was kind of like a, not, I guess not an art walk, but you would follow and see new artworks right. along the... Yeah, it was kind of like an art Oh, um, like to, an art walk. To, you know, to discover the different sculptures were installed. And they got a grant for it, and, hmm. you know, so th I think... And I think that was pre the three galleries. I think they started mm -hmm. that before that. So I think they were probably more the beginning of really creating something in the arts. And we just kind of helped a little. And then while you were out here, I guess out here in the 90s and in between the 90s and the 2000s, how was the environment in Greenport? Was there change Oh, happen. absolutely changed. When we first came out, they were bungee jumping <laughs> on the <laughs> waterfront. It, oh. it was before the the park. Before Mitchell Park? Yeah, it, it was after the restaurant had burned down. And it, our first year out here, they were literally Just... had a crane and doing bungee jumping. Wow. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, it was back when the shoe store was still at the corner on um, so things were just starting to change. It, it had a nice scrappy feeling. Like, I think there's a feeling of potential. So um, there, it, were, there weren't very many restaurants that were open in the winter. Oh. There were like three places, I think. And there were no stoplights, believe it or not, when we first came out here. All the way out. No stoplights? No. So, Nothing on the north road? No. Nope. It's just all... Oh, it's just straight. So uh, it's a lot denser than it was then. Uh, it was like the 1950s um, <laughs> when we first came out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. And it, you said it had kind of more of a, not rustic, but kind of... I, I forget. Yeah, an edge yeah. to it. Like, an edge to it, but it, it, it didn't feel... No, it didn't feel threatening. Threatening no. or unsafe. No. It, Just it, 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 kind of honest. Compared to now, it might seem more like, I don't want to say too polished, but you don't, it had more of a, not as much of new renovations. and. I mean, I'm not against new renovations because you have to if you're going to keep the town. Yes. So I'm not against that. There was just a sense of opportunity i think mm -hmm. so and that's an interesting comparison with greenport and riverhead because mm -hmm. everybody keeps going to riverhead thinking the same thing but then it doesn't quite happen and mm -hmm. in greenport it happened so it almost happened too much <laughs> in greenport mm -hmm. but it, so it's just whether who knows what that factor is that kind of kicks something over 
And then also for the people that were kind of, or you would say long time residents or grew up here and their family goes back, how is it moving out here and kind of like the locals that were here, did they see you as like, oh, you're coming from the city in the 90s? Yeah, there there was a little bit of that. Um, (laughs) And also we built a contemporary house. So people either loved it or hated it. You might get comments saying, oh, it's not traditional or in the traditional architecture of the area. Or... Yeah, it, I mean, yeah, some people didn't think it fit in. And then there was one guy who said, but it's the same materials. And yes. he, he kind of got, and one guy said, it's about the space, not the thing. You know, so some people got it. And some people didn't. (laughs) So there was a mixed reaction. And, you know, there there were different sets of people. There are people that had been here all the time. There are people that came out here all the time um, because they wanted to be here, but they were, like, looking for a refuge. We weren't sure, you know, if we'd be able to stay. Stay long term. Term. Um, there was a little bit of prejudice, but eventually the population became more diverse and a little more accepting. There's still, there's still some prejudice, but what I wish, I, I really like the diversity. I wish, I wish it was more integrated because I do feel the diversity tends to integrate. I mean, not integrate, not integrate, not integrate. And I wish that happened a little bit more. Just with the general population of the east end of the North Fork and Greenport. Yeah, you know, like uh, the black and Hispanic um, populations. Um, Actually, the black population was more evident back then. It was kind Mm -hmm. of a little richer. um, Compared to now. Compared to now. Of course, the Hispanic is very active and evident, but... And that was, was that evident in the 90s too, the Hispanic population? Not as much. That kind of came. It, 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 it was more of a wave that came during that period. And then separate from that, you got involved with the town here in environmental and climate yeah um i was on the transportation committee for a little bit but the environmental work stemmed from two things when i moved the gallery to riverhead we needed more space so we could have the architectural office as Mm -hmm. well we did a show that lillian ball actually co-curated and it was called to action um, it was environmental artists that were actually doing it, it that had an impact. Hmm. They were doing projects that um, weren't just about the environment, but trying to improve it. And so that was inspiring. And then for the American Institute of Architects, the local chapter, Um, every other year we had a planning committee that I was on and we had an all-day conference that we put together and we were trying to decide like what stops the hamlets from being dense and then having lots of open space in between and one of the major things are the rules about septic systems so we put on this all day we had experts come in and I learned a lot. And um, I also learned that we weren't treating our wastewater to a level that would protect the surface water bodies. And a woman from the EPA was there and she told us about the needs study and nobody was, I approached the county, they didn't want to do anything at that time. And so I saw an opportunity of a way to try and do something, because if you were successful, other people could duplicate it. So that gave a kind of focus. 
and we started <laughs> and um, again we were lucky Ed Romain gave us a $5,000 grant we, sp wow. we spent nine months working on it the town of Southampton donated GIS services and we put a report together and then submitted it. the town submitted it to the state it, as part of the needs survey but the state said wait a minute the county usually does this <laughs> not you <laughs> and so and from there it started evolving and then mm -hmm. and then the county got involved and and we partnered with the nature conservancy and ourselves were influential working with the county to start the enhanced septic treatment program because when you were doing the studies before or with EPA no they just told me about the needs survey mm -hmm. and I just did it on my own <laughs> wow <laughs> <laughs> with the incredible help of the GIS from the town of Southampton they were amazing so and it was easier to get the data because they don't mind giving it to a municipality whereas they wouldn't want to give it to me so I and they would run the data for me map it they were terrific and what was the problem environmentally that was happening um there was too much nitrogen that was causing um, algal blooms on the mm -hmm. surface water and the fish kill and stuff like that so um, we were looking at that on we were trying to determine where the priority areas were for mm -hmm. improvements and what kind of impact and how quickly the groundwater mm -hmm. hit the surface water that kind of thing and do you think some of it was from farms some of it is but the nature conservancy did a, a really good s study that I th think the county kind of updated as part of their comp plan that they just did and they calculated um, the amount of nitrogen going in mm -hmm. from different sources and it dep and they did it by sub watershed so like an orient in Orient Harbor, it's mostly from septic systems, but Helix is mostly from farms. So it's very localized. Overall, the septic was the a major uh, source, but in localized areas, it could be from farming. And trying to get that under control and mm -hmm. so that we wouldn't get algal blooms. Right. And I mean, just looking at the water now, it seems very clean. It, it still isn't clean enough. Um, and a lot of work needs to be done. Um, we still get algal blooms. Uh, Stony Brook University, Chris Goldler has a state of the bays every year. Um, and it's not good. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so a lot of work needs to be done, but people are doing things. And that's important. Uh, the county has their incredible program now, um, upgrading on-site wastewater systems. And, you know, different groups like with the oyster beds and, uh, you know, and I'm really interested in the seaweed, how that will be, because that could be a great way of sucking up the excess nitrogen. Kind of like a filtering process. Well, it, it actually absorbs. Not just like marshes where they usually a natural well, filtration filter. Yeah. system they're very important too mm. the marshes but yeah. this you said the seaweed mm. is actually absorbs right wow and would you say if you didn't start this then we could have had probably much more problems now and even like you see on the coast of florida and with those they have major problems down there where they yeah. haven't dealt with well <laughs> Florida actually has a good program, believe it or not. <laughs> I mean, that lake in the center there that is just with all the agriculture waste mm -hmm. just dumping. But um, there's one area where they really cleaned up the water and 
we learned a lot from them on some of their studies in the nitrogen reducing systems. We did a little tour. We went to different states and looked at what they were doing. Okay. Wow. So, and would you say during this process, did you get any pushback? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> Was it because of creating new regulations or... I mean, there were a lot of people that were against this, but I have to hand it to the county. There were a handful of people that were very open and Sarah Lansdale, who's head of planning, was very savvy on knowing what was needed to convince people to change. And there were still people in the department that were against it. But, you know, having people against it is a good thing because it makes you be honest in, you know, having to do your research. I mean, they really had a trial period for the different systems because they didn't want mm -hmm. systems that acted like they did well and then they didn't, you know. So I think people questioning um, whether we should do it or not was very influential and in developing standards where they could then justify what they were doing. And, you know, sometimes it's easy just to say, oh, if you do this, it'll be, but, but you know, you need the data to really support mm -hmm. what you're doing. So I think the county was very smart and mm -hmm. how they, once they finally came on board and started doing things. I think they were very smart on how they did it. And is there anything that residents can also do to help individually? Though it needs to come more from the county and the town to really help I push. Think, I think, you know, basically the way the county did it is you start with incentives and then you go to regulation once you've proved it. And I think that's the proper way to introduce these things because there's also a learning curve when you're introducing anything that's new. Mm -hmm. But I do think you end up having to do regulation because I don't think people will necessarily follow. follow. Um, and to get the kind of critical mass that you need to have an impact, I think you've got to get the majority of people on board. And was there any other work that you have been working on in the community related? Um, I got in trouble a bit because <laughs> <laughs> I also started thinking about, well, how much water do we have? You know, um, and I found a 1963 report that had the formula. So I started like, okay, can I take how much water we're actually using and follow the same criteria? Mm. And some people have really pushed back on it. But quite frankly, I think we're on the cusp of using too much water. Just within the town, uh, township yes. of South Hold yes. and yeah. just using it, too the, much water in general. Right. It, because we're so vulnerable for saltwater intrusion. So if we pump too much, then you contaminate the fresh water supply. And that's where I th think we're in trouble going forward, especially with the lawn irrigation. And we need water for things like food. It, you know, that, that should that's, be that's a priority. Priority over exactly. lawn care. <laughs> priority <laughs> and, you know, survival of families, you know, yes. having water to live, uh, you know, a clean <laughs> and effective life. But watering lawns is a low priority and it uses. It, in the summer, it can be half the water that gets used. So to me, that is a travesty. That would be something that you would, that there should be a regulation on. I absolutely mm -hmm. think there should. And you might have to say, do the same thing where you gradually do it with incentives and whatever, mm. but it's such a waste of water. And then besides just wasting the water, you said pulling out too much. Yeah, if, if you draw, because basically we have what's called a sole source aquifer and on the east end it's actually sitting on salt water mm. it's floating on salt water so if you draw too intensely you can suck the salt water 
into the freshwater lens and you can contaminate it. Yeah. So um, that's probably the biggest danger. And with climate change and sea level rising, that that's also going to affect affect the, uh, that interface of salt water and the fresh water. So it's something that needs to be watched. I mean, Suffolk County Water Authority solution is to pipe fresh water from the Pine Barrens, which to me is not a sustainable future. You know? No, it's <laughs> kind of like a Band-Aid yeah. temporarily mm-hmm. without really preparing or planning ahead. Right. Is this something you've that's been brought up at South Hole? It has, town. but but I really think what needs to happen, like, I'm not an expert. Mm-hmm. I brought awareness of the topic, but it needs to be done by professionals that can influence people. Hmm. So, I think you know what I did was like a citizen awareness thing where I, mm-hmm. I brought this, I spent a lot of time. I took all the records for a whole year from Suffolk County Water Authority. And then, it, I mean, I, I really tried hard to get as accurate <laughs> as I can, although some people disagree. But I think carrying capacity of different things, of transportation and um, water resources need to be considered when you're planning. And conservation goes a long way. Like in the mm-hmm. West, uh, conservation has improved resources 50%. So it doesn't mean you have to go without, mm. but you have to decide what your priorities are and understand there's a limit to your resources. So how can you manage that How do you manage the growth and the resources in an intelligent way so it's balanced? It doesn't mean you just stop everything, but it... Kind of bring it back and... Do it smarter. Yeah. And separate from the water supply, what's another issue that you think is a top priority for our region or our area? Um, I think there are a couple of things. Um... A number, actually. (laughs) One is solid waste um, and how we deal with it. And can we be more creative and more careful in how we create and manage the waste? Um, I think there's an intensity of use going on, and that can translate to hard coverage of the land that soaked Hmm. the water up as well as use. Um, This intensification doesn't always match the regulations. So getting a better handle on that. And transportation, I mean, look at the South Fork, how we do transportation. And, you know, maybe the same models that everybody has been looking at for 30 years won't work here. Hmm. Maybe we have to come up with something else. I don't know. Well, I know that the South Fork has increased their frequency of the Long Island mm-hmm. Railroad. And mm-hmm. obviously we're getting more traffic, but we don't have it as bad yet as the South Fork. I think, I, I guess I've talked to people before about it, and I think increasing the Long Island Railroad and possibly getting more bus routes in the area. Actually, the county did a really good bus study um, a few years ago, but with the change in administration, it just got dropped. But somebody should bring, but it costs money. And, Mm -hmm. you know, but one, I would start with that. I think it was, you know, sensible. I don't think, though, you're going to get a big change to mass transit environment because of the land use and the way it's spread out. So you might have to think differently, like electric bikes on a separated road or how you handle people that are coming in for the day. 
you know parking a, and, and in the summer and affordability of housing a lot of the traffic is the trade parade you know so having affordable housing and not making this like an exclusive area but having it integrated so people aren't traveling for hours to get to hmm. their jobs attracting new jobs to the area too that are year uh, round <laughs> that are year round and right do you think the possibility of I mean, obviously, Long Island's known for its sprawl mm -hmm. and having to drive to work and to the grocery store. And mm -hmm. I guess just for Greenport, if we look at Greenport, is it possible to create more of a walkable downtown? Well, and... well I think Greenport is an example of one of the better kinds of walkable environments. It's got everything. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's what makes Greenport so attractive um, because you can be here without a car. And I've known a few people that didn't have cars that lived in Greenport. Um, so I think Greenport is by far one of the better locations with that, for that. And with affordable housing, do you think creating more two, three-story buildings that are close to the village better than a development that's out in the the woods that people have to use cars to get to yeah i i think it should be integrated and i don't think it should be a housing development no. because then you marginalize people by the idea of it it should be so that you don't even realize like there's one apartment here there's another yes. here <laughs> it's just kind of blending Blend in naturally in. and people right. coexist exactly Without feeling like, oh, I got to go into this community to. Right. That, I mean, that would be my ideal. So. And I guess just to, and you might have answered some of the, this already, but what do you hope for the future of our community out here down the road? I hope that as a community, we start making decisions based on a very threatening future um, in terms of climate change. Um, we are extremely vulnerable. And if we don't start being proactive instead of reactive, we're going to be in tough shape in the future. So I think it's extremely important. And, you know, we may not have all the answers, but if you don't start planning and thinking and there might be some retreating i mean most of our historical districts are in flood zones hmm. in some of these hamlets not all but you know so what do we value and how how do we keep what we value and how do we still protect what attracts us to this area in this uncertain future so I want to thank you again for coming on the podcast today. And it was really nice getting to hear your story and how your interest and in paths and how you came out onto the North Fork and the awareness you brought to people out here with our water and making sure our water's clean. And thank you so much for coming on today. Oh, thank you for having me. Well, I hope you enjoyed episode 14 with Glennis Berry. I want to thank you for listening to the Floyd Memorial Library podcast, and we'll see you soon.